Good day, everybody. Uh, meaning good morning, good day, good evening, depending on the places where you are. Welcome to, and thank you to our panelists for being here, and thank you to everybody who is attending the session. This is the session on the Emerging New Civilizations Initiative. I will do the role, I will take the role of the moderator of this panel. I am Carlos Alvarez Pereira, member of the Executive Committee of the Club of Rome, and uh, together with our co-president, Mampela Rampele, who is also in the panel, and with Petra Kunkel, I coordinating the, this initiative of the Club of Rome called Emerging New Civilizations. Uh, so what is this about? It is about the idea that the world has to shift to earn something which we could call sustainable well-being, or to be a bit more precise, equitable human well-being within and at peace with a healthy biosphere. And that means a lot of things, and that means deep, deep changes in the way we understand the world and in the way we deal with, with the world, with ourselves, with others, and, and, and with nature. And it basically means to take uh, new civilizational choices, fundamentally different from, from all those which were taken in the last three centuries by the dominant cultures. The choices which were taken and by the way which were imposed to many other cultures and to many other people in the world. And uh, of course, this means that we have so many challenges to deal with and that they are complex, but also intertwined. Not only complex each of them, we cannot isolate any of them. I think that the COVID pandemic has shown pretty well how we cannot separate health from technology, from economy, from politics, from culture, for education. Everything is intertwined as it is in, in nature. And that's also means, that also means that if we look for deep transformations, we have to look for particularly for cultural transformation. So cultural transformation is the cornerstone of this initiative of the MCI. It's about defining or adopting new epistemologies, new, new worldviews, especially built upon the interdependencies, the concept that interdependencies are the core not not something collateral and about the idea that uh, we have to deeply transform our, our the elements of our culture meaning deeply transform our fears the perception of our needs of what we need to be to have what is human well-being well what do we, do we need for that and also transform what we think is acceptable or not and move the lines of what is unacceptable. Of course, this is very much about values, any particular relationship between values, and we use the same word to talk about values in the ethical, aesthetic, moral senses of the term, and economic value, and we know well that economic value, the way we have defined it, is able to destroy the values we cherish the most. Another aspect of the NCI is about the role of territorial communities. In the Club of Rome, we devote a lot of effort to try to influence public agendas and to influence policy makers. And of course, that's very useful. But uh, let's also put energy on looking at what is happening on the ground in many different places in the world. So this is also about why we call it emerging because many things are emerging, but they are emerging at the level of territorial communities, because only in their territorial contexts and within a certain culture, we think communities will find the, their own pathway towards sustainable well-being. Sustainable well-being will mean many different things depending on who and where. And another fundamental element of ENCI is to question the existing model of knowledge creation. If we are consistent with what I just said, we have to start with new questions and better questions. So the way knowledge creation is organized today in siloed way and pretty much in a 
top-down manner um, for the purpose of the transformations we want to achieve is obsolete. So we have to put it upside down and start from the questions that the people on the ground have and build new knowledge uh, from that. And this, of, of course, leads to a fundamental uh, idea of ENCI is that what I call most of the world. As I said, it's about making different civilizational choices than the ones we have made in the past and we have imposed to others. Well, I think this will be easier to understand and to do and to act on that from the perspectives of those others on which we have imposed those choices. And from uh, what Nora Bateson, my, cl my Club of Rome colleague, Nora Bateson calls the liminal spaces. And uh, this last um, idea is very much the reason why uh, I have organized this panel together with Mampella, making sure that we have typically unheard voices. We have voices from all over the world, from all continents, and only women. This does not mean that men have no role to play. I hope we have some play, some role to play in the positive in transformations towards desirable futures. But we have to hear from the voices of, of Asia, of Africa, of all over the world, and the voices of, of women. All of them are young in their spirits, and additionally, most of them are young in their ID cards. So I think we will have a really exciting conversation. And uh, we start with the first round of interventions around that uh, question of um, what do you think from your own uh, experience, knowledge, feelings, what do you think can contribute to the kind of social transformation, deep transformation we are talking about towards well-being, sustainable well-being at peace with the, with the biosphere. And, uh, and we start from, uh, from the USA, from uh, Vermont. It's pretty early there. It's 6 a.m., uh, nine minutes after 6 a.m. So Amanda, Janu, many thanks for, uh, I'm very sorry for getting you out of bed at this time. Uh, how do you see all this from your experience and from Vermont? Your, the floor is yours. Excellent. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I, as I speak to you from the United States of America, this question of culture and well-being is obviously very timely and profound because perhaps the most powerful U.S. export is our culture, a culture that is presented as selfish, ambitious, materialistic, and innovative. We can see right now so many of the deep wounds and pain that this culture creates that emphasizes individual exceptionalism in a system where it's nearly impossible to be exceptional. Um, we feel the pain of millions who are struggling to meet their basic needs in the supposedly richest country in the world. And we're seeing the social fabric of society tearing as we fragment and divide across racial and political and gendered lines. We sit in a moment of profound transformation as a society and as a culture, as the veils are being removed and the deep hypocrisy and injustice of the American dream is being presented. However, I must say that the US you're seeing on the news and in your television shows is not the one I have experienced. I'm from a very small town in rural Vermont, a town with one paved road and a general store, a town that's so small that we don't have a police or a government. Rather, we have a town meeting where every spring people gather for a couple of days to discuss the town's budget and priorities. This was my introduction to politics and my introduction to economics. Living in a community of carpenters, farmers, teachers, and caregivers, I was raised in a culture that emphasized generosity and stewardship. I left this small town at 15, very much driven by ambition to explore the world and to experience more than I thought this small town could offer. And during college, I learned about this crazy discipline called economics and the assert assumptions it held regarding who we are. I did not see myself in the rational competitive individual that they believed us all to be. I questioned where the compassion, generosity, and interdependencies were that I'd seen all around me and in my life. 
Furthermore, the idea that across cultures, economies function the same way seemed at best false and at worst deeply destructive. Working in international development and just living in different communities, I saw so clearly how culture influences the way that people produce and provide for one another. I remember feeling a lot of shame when I was working in Mozambique and an economist there explained that it would take time to change their culture to achieve the entrepreneurial spirit we had in America. He said that investors had a hard time in Mozambique because people would show up for work for a day or two and then leave and go back to their villages and only return again once they needed more money for their families or communities. What they had was a culture that recognized enough. And I realized in that moment that I had no concept of enough. We do not even consider this question in the US. There can never be enough because it stands in conflict with the cultural principles of ambition and progress that we hold very dear. So these questions of what do I want and when will I be satisfied were incredibly profound for me and made me re recognize that what I needed was wisdom much more than intelligence if I wanted to meaningfully change this economic system. Because our economy or the way we produce and provide for one another has always been a powerful mechanism for preserving, transforming, or even eradicating cultures. I believe that now more than ever, we need to reinstill our economy with the values of generosity and contentment, as these are the values that can help to rebalance and heal our worlds, to promote cultures of human well-being within a healthy ecosystem. I do want to apologize for the incredible damage my country and my culture has inflicted on the world. We are in a moment of profound and painful transformations. Paradigms are shifting and we are likely in our final days of empire. America's in a very bad way. But despite or perhaps because of this, um, I recently decided to move back to my small town in Vermont after 17 years abroad. I speak to you now from a cabin in South Stratford, and I find hope in institutions like our town meeting, that we can facilitate participatory processes to discuss and reevaluate the things that truly matter, that we can build economic systems that are aligned with our unique context, values, and objectives. But I also recognize that we have a lot to learn, which, I'm, which is why I'm really grateful and honored to be part of this panel with such incredible women from across the globe. For if there was ever a time to abandon ego and to embrace some new ways of thinking, it is now. I see the crisis we face as global and that we're in this together, whether we like it or not. But I believe that the wisdom's out there and that if we're willing to take a step back, we'll find it sprinkled across the globe and find the blueprints for a better world we envision. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this inspiring world. Now we, we, we shift to the other side of the world. From, I, am, I am in Madrid, so from Madrid, Australia is exactly the, the opposite. Um, when people who were, I mean, many of them were Spaniards, uh, completing, completed the five centuries ago, you know, the trip around the world, uh, we had the idea that you people in Australia would be heads down, you know. But I see you, Audre Lobopulo, uh, with your head firmly set on your shoulders. So from Sydney, what do you have to, to share with us? Thank you, Carlos, for a um, wonderful introduction. And I'm so honored to be here with you all. I would love to take a moment for us all to just, you know, feel the earth under your feet as I, um, I myself would like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of our land and give you know, thanks um, and acknowledge our elders past, present and future. But um, the, the, the question about culture is so deeply ingrained in not, just the, in not just humanity, but in also our planet and the earth that we're on. And my passion is around technology, which is which may seem so far removed from this concept of humanity and you know the planet and the well-being. And what has you know obsessed, you know, ha has me obsessed over is how do we maintain the integrity of our human relationships and maintain the integrity of our culture and our connection to each other and the planet and the creatures around us 
amidst this technology. And um, it's almost as if there is a bit of an odds where if we dive much more deeper into big data and tech and artificial intelligence, we are removing ourselves from humanity. So the question that comes up for me, Carlos, in my experience is how does civilization begin? Because we've always had technologies and we've developed these technologies over time. And, um, and I came across some, a really interesting piece which has shaped the way I think about technology. And that was um, a quote by Margaret Mead, who was an, was an American anthropologist. And she was you know, giving this beautiful lecture. And one of the students asked her, you know, what in her opinion was the first sign of human civilization? And so she says to the, the student, she says, well, the first sign was um, a cave um, in a, like an, um, an archaeological site where they dug up um, the human remains of a thigh bone that had been broken and repaired. And that site was like 15,000 years ago. And, you know, it was an odd response from the student's perspective. But what she was essentially saying was that this human bone would never have repaired itself without the care of a community. And so that was the first acknowledgement that there was this level of empathy and this communal care for someone to survive a broken thigh bone. And that was the first sign of human civilization. And so taking that concept into you know, my space, which is around technology and how the interactions we have are so transactional now. Where is, um, you know, where is that interrelation? Where is the dependencies between parties and connect? Where is the connectivity? Where is the care? How do we design a world for, um, that embraces fragility? Where is the care in the systems that we create? And I think, you know, for me, it's about those, those small relationships and finding ways to put that level of care, whether it is through technology or whether it is through the distance, different systems that we interact with, the economic systems or the health systems or the educational systems. How do we, how do we hold sacred that human thread that connects us all to each other? Um, so that has been my sort of focus in this space. Excellent, thank you so much, Audrey, for this. Yeah, it is beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, citation from, from Margaret Mead. It, it, says, it says a lot. And now we move um, from Australia to Asia and Europe at the same time, because we have with us Azadeh Farashpur Javazmi, who is uh, from Iran, but living in, in Germany. I'm sure Azadeh, uh, you have, uh, I'm sure, a lot to share with us. The thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. And thank you to all ladies. Um, and I'm so uh, happy to be here. Um, yes, um, what I wanted to say is, what I want to say is very related to what Audrey and Amanda already said. Uh, when we look at the culture, where it, where it come from, comes from, um, a culture emerges when people come together. So it means when people are bound together, when, when people share similarities, when people overcome prejudices and build up trust um, and get to know each other more and better, and they can um, work in a, in a very, uh, or in a similar direction, not all in different direction, so all in a, sim a similar direction. Um, these, um, coming together, these coming or um, bringing people together is, in my point of view, very important um, that uh, the new emerging or emerging new civilization can do. This is what you have done now, bringing all ladies around the world together in a plan, uh, on a, a panel. So um, finding similarities, I found already similarities, what, uh, what um, Amanda said and what Address said so. It is. It's very important to get to know people. Um, I can. I can share my uh, experience in Germany. Um, when I say some uh, expressions or sayings in in Persian in in my language and uh, translated to German, um, they say uh, we have the same one, but it's but it's uh, called something different. But the 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 the, the main purpose 
what the message is is similar um, and uh, so it means when you bring people together so um, you put um, common goals in a, on a table and then you have this um, interaction between people um, this is what I really liked when I was in New Zealand the, there is a program work and travel so you um, are you live six seven months or one year with a family who do not know but after one year you share very you share some similarities and also a common culture maybe um, that you never had before and um, these are the things that um, can bind people together and to aim for the same purpose. Um, the more people I know, the better they know me and uh, the better we can get along. It's a logical thing. So uh, in my point of view, the world is a, is a puzzle. This is what we also talked, Carlos, about it two weeks ago. Um, we have about one, um, 119, more than 190 nations, we have thousands of cultures, we have more than 6,000 languages, and we have seven, or we are 7.5 billion people on the planet. And these are all pieces of puzzles, of a big puzzle. If you want to solve the puzzle, or if you uh, want to build, to see the beautiful picture at the end of the puzzle, you must bring all these pieces together. And otherwise, you cannot solve the puzzle and see the beautiful picture at the end. So each, people, each person, each individual had, has its own shape. It's not identical. And nobody has this shape in this planet. So you are unique in your form, your thought, your view, how you see the world. And the world needs you to, to solve this puzzle for, at the end, seeing this beautiful picture. And building a new civilization means trying to get people solving this puzzle. This is what can this initiative do, uh, do um, very, very well uh, in my point of view. Um, now is the question how we can bring people together. Um, I can only give an example of how it does not work. Um, I have been living in Germany since five years now and uh, I noticed how, how our, our media is promoting fragmentation within the societies, within the cultures, and between the cultures, among the countries. The only thing that I read in, in our media, in our news, is the bad, the ugly, the um, uh, sad news, the catastrophe, catastrophes from all around the world. Uh, the countries are all poor, are all ugly. It's not something, it's, there's nothing beautiful in this world. And Consequently, you feel that they are bad guys and you do not want to be part of a game where they are in the game. So you exclude yourself automatically because you don't want to be at the same level where they are. The poor, ugly people, you don't want them you, because you, you believe for, from your instinct we are better. That's why we, are, we think we are better than, human, than animal because we are better although we are the same, uh, we have the same um, um, uh, goods. Um, just an example of this, what I said, the wall between Mexico and the United States. This means that you don't want to part of this game. That, that, that's, what, that's why you put a wall between you and your country. Do I have time? Can I continue? Carlos? No, uh, no, sorry, Azadeh. No, you don't have any more time for okay, now. So, I mean, I, I'm done for now. <laughs> I mean, there will be there will be more uh, later. I loved uh, I loved what you what you said, and um, and in particular, just to to elaborate on one of the last things you said. When I, I say we need a, a shift in our worldviews in our culture, we have to unlearn and learn the idea that we are better than nature because just because we can destroy it. Because this is, this is a core assumption of uh, the, the, the incumbent way of thinking is that we can destroy nature so we are better than nature. And the same with other cultures. We can 
win other and destroy other cultures and not destroy other people so we are better than them. This is part of the fantasy of exclusion you were talking about. So we have to go um, beyond, uh, beyond that. And um, now um, we go to, to Europe, to Italy, to the place where uh, 50 years ago the Club of Rome was founded. And I think it had, the foundation of the club had some impact, but I'm very much biased since I am a member. But let's take the temperature of what happens in Rome from the perspective of what happens in Rome, what can be said about these emerging new civilizations. So Rebecca Wetting from Rome, you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thanks. Thank you all for inviting me to this session. I, I really have the feeling that we could go on with this panel for uh, a day and more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because we have yes. so much to say and we share so much. I really feel and resonate with everything that uh, Amanda Azadeh and Audrey said uh, so far. Um, and I also picked some, some parts of your um, of your interventions to, 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 to tell what I thought uh, in between, because I resonated so much when Amanda recalled their town hall meetings, and this is exactly what uh, I resonate with, because in Italy we are, uh, we call ourselves a country, but in, in fact, we are a constellation of small villages, a constellation of small communities, and a constellation of uh, uh, people thriving, uh, actually, since, uh, since ages. And, far before far, far before the Roman Empire, uh, which was our first example of a globalization <laughs> uh, attempt. Uh, I, I really feel when you say that we don't know the word enough, we don't know the word limits, we don't know how to, uh, you, we don't know anymore because I really think that we, we had it before and we have to unlearn uh, this uh, uh, concept of, of getting whatever we want and leaving, uh, leaving behind only uh, deserts and um, and death. I mean, this is uh, this is what I really mm, see as a as a future possible civilization uh, uh, is the age of empathy, as uh, to say it with risking word. I think that the thriving communities uh, will be self-sustaining, and uh, if informed by science, they can also be self-regulating with the resources they have uh, around them, and they can actually share. Uh, the, the, the good practices with the communities are around instead of closing ourselves into walls and into uh, smaller and smaller communities and be fragmented by this uh, idea that we are better than the other, that we are richer and we can do better and we can go farther. We don't have to go farther, we have to be here and we have to be here together. So um, I, I feel that the word unlearning is a very nice word because uh, it um, it, it sounds like a negative word, but being a female, maybe we understand the positive uh, <laughs> input of negative words, like uh, making some empty space for new things is very important because we can then build uh, something different and actually we can really um, get back in our hearts and your, in our souls what we had before, because we, we, we know that we, in all our cultures, we have some grandmother that, uh, told us the good stories about how they could survive into the into challenging situations and this is uh, what we have to do now we are in an emergency and as part of the extinction rebellion movement i think that this is uh, one of my priorities and so i really think that taking responsibility uh, and decision power and empowerment from territorial communities is uh, is the priority now we have to really work over it and yeah, that, I got that's it for the moment. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, we have uh, more than 50 attendants, so uh, please, um, you are welcome. I mean, besides compliments to the panelists, which are, are co of course welcome and well deserved, you can also ask questions in the, in the chat the chat panel of the Zoom session, so um, we will have time for discussing uh, questions later. And um, now we go to, 
to Asia. I mean, we have already been part of Asia with Azade from Iran, uh, but Asia is very big. I'm not sure that everybody knows that uh, 60%, 60% of the world's population is under this label of Asia, which is so extremely diverse, you know. And another close to 20 is in Africa. So between Asia and Africa, that makes 80%. That's what I call most of the world. So from Manila, uh, Samantha, uh, what do you think? Thank you, Carlos. And thank you all ladies for your statement so far. Very interesting to hear your perspectives. Um, Audrey mentioned something that I feel I want to pick up on, which is the thread that connects us all together. It's almost too beautiful to say it that way. Uh, in fact, I don't believe the thread that connects us all together is human at all. The only thing that binds us fundamentally is a biosphere that can actually support and sustain human culture, whatever that evolves to become. So I'm here to introduce and hold tension. Some of what has been said so far definitely resonates with me, but by far not enough. So I'd like to start to tackle the question head on. Human well-being within a healthy biosphere, how might we get there? From my perspective, what we need is a culture of openness to create psychological safety. And psychological safety is important to create the space for the individual to belong. And this, we already talked about empathetic leadership that's needed to create these open spaces. Further, we need a system of education also touched upon that teaches us how to learn from nature. We haven't talked about that yet. Propaganda, really important. This is how we communicate. We need propaganda that turns into beliefs and eventually turns into myths and legends. We need all this to develop a collective sense of stewardship and nurturing. Mm -hmm. And if all else fails, what would really help us get to this point where we can actually survive on this planet is, I believe, collapse. Following which, some sort of strict communal feudalism to manage large-scale landscape regeneration and the enforced creation of new indigenous societies. So what I'm talking about is going back to medieval times. What do I mean by new indigenous societies? I'm not gonna go into that now, but happy to discuss further later if it comes up again. You, you still have some time, Sam, so please do. No, right now, because I want to talk about the fundamental shift that first needs to happen if okay. we are to pursue any of these things, which is something I don't talk very often about, a spiritual shift. All religions point to one thing, we already have the answers within ourselves. And all we need to do is to make the difficult choice to seek them in the dark. When we get back to our true selves, we begin to restore our connection to nature in parallel. Collapse and spirituality is not things that I talk about on a daily basis, but they are becoming more and more real. These are conversations already being had consistently within global regeneration networks, especially the Earth Regenerators Network and the Cultural Evolution Society. If humanity is to survive civilizational collapse with its morality intact, more people need to be having these conversations today. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you for, as you said, introducing some tension. And um, I like you said, uh, it's about taking, making the difficult choice. You know, uh, It's not about choosing between the good or the bad and the bad. I mean, if it was, if it was that, it would be easy, you know? So, oh, this is the good and this, that is the bad. So yeah, you take the good. No, it's about choosing between the good and the easy, you know, and the good one is for sure difficult. So with this, we go back to the to the mother continent, to to Africa, and to my uh, dear colleague and co-president of the Club of Rome, 
Mampela Rampele. So from Cape Town, could you share your views with us? Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, and uh, my beloved, uh, I think they probably are at the level of being my daughters in, in terms of age. What really fascinates me about this panel is the connection uh, visible and invisible, or the threads that are common or not common. And what, <clears throat> where I want to start is uh, at the end where Samantha left us. I come from a continent that is the cradle of humanity. And that makes it a special place but not necessarily the better than other places, but it has a special role. It's like being a grandmother. You have a special role of having given birth to generations. And that's the place of Africa. And that therefore means that I have the heritage, very direct heritage of the seamless connections between the first thing that made life possible, which is that light, that spirit that Samantha was talking about. And that spirit is in everything that has got life. And that spirit we didn't have a church to go to or a mosque or a temple. The spirit is in you. And as Samantha says, you travel inwards and you, 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 you get into the dark and the light is always there shining. And of course, from that dark, you can see the other lights that are shining. And this is why one of the first things I believe we need to do, taking from many of the comments that were made here, which raise one fundamental thing. There is only one human race. The idea of uh, multiracial, interracial, I don't know where it comes from. Because life is, was given to us as human beings, what we look like really doesn't matter when it comes to that spirit that Samantha was talking about, that thread that um, was raised as well by... Um, by, by Yeah. And so there is so much that bring us back to our belonging together. And so when Margaret Mead says, the first civilization happened when, or oh, evidence of it, is where you have human remains with a, a healed, fe broken femur. And so on this continent, the way we understand life and the interconnectedness between human beings and between human beings and all other beings, plant or animal, is so deeply ingrained that it's a way of life. So the use of the term Ubuntu is not some kind of slogan. It is a deeply spiritual statement of the interconnections and the intertwined nature. And these connections are not just between us as people who are alive today, they go back to our ancestors and they go forward to those yet to be born. And that imposes a responsibility on all of us to play our roles on this earth in a way that respects what we have inherited, 
but also that doesn't damage that which has been entrusted to us for the future. And so I liked what um, was said by Amanda about this, this concept of enough. Because one of the, uh, the way I was brought up in a village was there was never a thing like somebody has not been invited and therefore can be, can participate in whatever you interview. There's always enough. It's a mindset, this scarcity mindset that has led us to categorize people and color coding is the easiest way of categorizing people. But when you take away color coding and you just see human beings, it's amazing what magic happens. Magic happens because everything becomes so much easier, so much, not less complex, but easier in the sense of you do not have to spend negative energy othering. It's all positive when you are col collaborating, ready, ready to learn. And the, I, the, the metaphor and the imagery I'll take away from this part of the conversation is that Vermont Spring Village Meeting or the constellation of villages that uh, actually constitute what we call Italy or Rome. And so we have a wonderful heritage as human beings as we are struggling for a new civilization to emerge, we need to go back to claim that which we rejected. Uh, I might not go as far as Samantha in the kind of forced uh, recreation of indigenous societies, but I think what she is suggesting is that there's so much to be gained from our her heritage that we, in a sense, would be unwise not to go back and reclaim that as a foundation for how we become better having learned from the cost of fragmenting and losing that connection that the spirit in us demands that we should have. I'll stop there for now. Okay, many thanks. We still have uh, 45 minutes in this panel, and as um, somebody said, I don't remember it was Rebecca, we could, we could continue for hours and days. Um, there are some comments and, and, and questions from the, from the audience. I will take one or will bring some elements of response to one and give it also to you, uh, dear panelists. And I will also highlight another one, which has been which just been put on the on the chat. So uh, one of our um, attendants is asking, "What do we mean by the logic of life?" Which is in the in the in my put in the convocation of this session that. This is about reconciling ourselves with the logic of life, which implies that we are not reconciled with the logic of life. But uh, that doesn't mean that we can define very well the logic of life, because life is one of those attributes, concepts, ideas that we cannot define without referring to life itself. Like love, I mean, the most important things, this is also about uh, learning, you know, and, and getting out of the idea that we can have objective knowledge about things. There are many things, the most important things, we cannot have objective knowledge. We cannot get out of them and define them. And life is among them and love is among them. But we can say something about the logic of, uh, of life and why we say we are not pursuing, we're not acting according to the, the logic of life. And one big thing is that as a, the, my friend, I mean, she could be also here in this panel, Lynn Gorison is a biologist. Uh, she has identified a number of principles. I will not go into all of them, but just mention three. 
There is no taking without giving. It takes an ecosystem to sustain an ecosystem. And interdependency rules. Nothing occurs in isolation. So that's part of the, definitely part of the logic of life. So, and uh, then there is a um, comment on, well, there could be a better way. I think this has been provoked by Samantha. There could be a better way rather than conflict between science and society, growth and preservation, uh, defined as, I quote, uh, growth with compassion through improvements in science. So, who, who among our panelists would like to, to comment on both things or whatever else you have in mind? Audrey, go ahead. I just want to add a bit more controversy, Carlos, if I may, and that Go is, uh, I, think, I think we need both the logical and the illogical in life. We need objectivity and subjectivity. We need science and art. We need, you know, um, it, a mixture of the two. And I think it's only in that beautiful intimate dance and that intricate dance between the two that we can find that balance that we're so yearning for. And my, my feeling is that we've separated those two. And going back you know, to the comments around you know, that indigenous connection that we had, they, they understood that because they didn't separate that. And I, my, my sense is when that separation happened is when the fragmentation started to occur. Um, and so I would love to hear what others think on, on that. Well, going back to the issue of uh, the logic of life, one of the beautiful uh, wisdoms that we were brought up with, and of course, all indigenous people, you can, it's very interesting actually, it's like when I listen to Audrey and I listen to Samantha, it's like, I mean, all of us on this panel tap into this common wisdom, which is in all of us as human beings, but this kind of rat race we, we have, and that's the beauty of COVID. COVID has slowed us all down. And the lockdowns have forced us into spaces of reflection, those dark places that uh, someone referred to. And so, when you reflect on life, the logic of life is that once that spark of life has been lit, it never dies. So in, in my culture, we know that for sure, that our ancients, their lights are still with us. And the lights of those who are going still to be born will be picking it's almost like, you know, how you, you light candles, one lighting the candle of the other. That's the way the understanding of the web of life in, in my cosmology. And, and that is why it's, I cannot see Carlos as alien or anybody, whatever they look like, because we share this common light which comes from one source. And that source, as someone said, is not human, it's, it's, it's sacred. Uh, the, the, in, in, in some ancient writings, is the one with no name, uh, the, the, the source of all life that you can't describe. As Sakhalo says, you can't define the logic of life because you, you know, it's, it's like uh, you are in it. But I think if we allow ourselves also to use the, the wisdom of the ancients, and this is about this dancing that Audrey is referring to. Dancers allow one to uh, feel the energy both within and outside and to connect with things you wouldn't otherwise be able to connect, as she was saying, the logic and the illogical and so on. And, and I think, again, when you, you slow down from this red race that we have created because we don't know what is enough, 
we we lose the art of dancing with problems with things that we see as uh, imponderables or things that we see as contrast and when you dance long enough you're going to be able to see the the merging the the the, the coming together but to do this dancing to 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 have this consciousness of this sacred life within all of us. We have to unlearn, as someone said, unlearning is like creating empty spaces. We have to unlearn the uh, unwillingness to be in these comfortable empty spaces because we want to fill everything with uh, the nervous energy. And so I think that the explorations that we are involved in of what would a new civilization look like not going back to caves but how do we have the deep spiritual consciousness in the midst of all the technological and the scientific prowess that we have developed as a human race but i think to do that we need to address the fundamental problem of having despite knowing for sure in scientific terms that there is only one human race there is a refusal to accept that because the idea of races gives us excuses why we treat other people differently why we build walls why we discount why we always feel we are better than and so I think part of the building of a new civilization has to be about clearing the cobwebs in our mental and spiritual spaces so we can truly reconnect with the essence of who we are as humanity. And when we do that, we will see what really matters versus the things that we have made to matter. We'll also see what is of value, which should be part of our value systems. And that way, I think, and of course, the willingness to listen, because listening to the, 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 the sound of one's voice is easy, and that's why I must stop. But I really believe that there are some very interesting things that are coming out of the wisdom of these ladies. Fantastic, Mampela. You, you mentioned dancing, dance, and this brought to my mind that uh, somebody we would, uh, would love to have here uh, and be honored to have here, if she was alive, is uh, Donella Meadows, who, as you probably know, was the lead author of the Limits to Growth report, which gave its reputation to the Club of Rome almost 50 years ago. No actual surprise in the fact that most of the more original thinking is coming, has been coming from women for decades. And uh, Audrey uh, mentioned Margaret Mead before. So Donella Meadows, uh, the very last paper she wrote before passing away, is titled Dancing with Systems. She evolved during her lifetime from a quite uh, mechanistic perspective of systems to understand complexity and to uh, the shift of understanding that complexity is not an issue, it's not a problem, it's not something that we have to eliminate, it's the foundation of life. And realizing with that title, you know that it's all about dancing with uh, with systems so uh let's go on with our other panelists who wants to to say to say something you are you have been quiet for a while uh, maybe as a day who rebecca go ahead rebecca thank you carlos i raised my hands in the chat but i see that that, that uh, system is not really working it's a, not the right procedure, so I use my hand, which is also nicer to see, I guess. I, I really like what Mampela said, and I was following her um, 
her discourse uh, by the idea of uh, what she said in the beginning that multicultural, multiracial, multi, multi, they, they all understate separation. They all uh, refer to a separation that, that is not there, actually. We are we're really so connected. So the, the difference and, and who de deserves and who doesn't deserve the resources that we have, the limited resources that we have is a really um, a struggling topic, uh, topic for, for me at least. It's, uh, it's really the, the thing that every day I wake up and think, why, why does this happen? This is happening. So uh, it's true that we have to start this conversation and this is an uncomfortable conversation. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we're going through the societal struggles if we don't tackle this, uh, this topic. And I really like uh, realizing that the word Academy of Art and Science uh, has two words in the name. Uh, and it, it, uh, it's not, I don't see it as building bridges, but I see it more as a dancing in the same water. Like we have to base together and go with the flow of life uh, hand by hand because science is not, uh, should not be separated from, not only from art, it should not be separated from spirituality and from our ethical questions. So if we ask us ourselves the right questions, like who, how do we, um, how do we thrive together? How do we get everyone on board? How can we really be on the same boat instead of someone in a big boat and someone in a very small boat, uh, probably dying in a, in a sea, trying to get to the so-called civilized world? Um, I, I love the idea of dancing together. So this is a simply simple as that. I wanted to to make this uh, emerge, like uh, really science, uh, we use the word science, but we use the word science for a lot of things. We use the, the word science for economics, which is not a science. It's just uh, really sometimes it's just uh, reading the numbers that we have around, but this is not really telling us about anything about the future. Uh, so ecology is a science, but ecology is nature. So nature, we cannot say that nature is a science. So if we focus on not only on the human being, if we focus on life, we will reframe the, the, the meaning of this word. We will have a different uh, uh, meaning for the word science. We will have a different perception of what it is, I think. So we can get out of that silos and separation uh, concept. Azadeh, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you, Mampela, and thank you, um, Rebecca. This is very connected to what I want to say um, is on, on one hand, uh, we must um, remind ourselves what we have achieved in the last decades uh, or even um, centuries uh, through the human civilization we have got. So um, this is exactly what Mampella said, um, that um, we all emerge uh, from nature and we must have this in spirit in us that um, um, to go with our nature biosphere, to work with it, not against it. And the other thing is uh, what I have experienced in the last five years in Germany uh, that does not work or does not fit in this concept is that we want to save the world. As I said, uh, as I talked with Carlos, I learned in Germany that we need to save the world. And with this ideology, we cannot go with each other and we cannot um, sit at the same table where others sit and we cannot talk and that's why we have a big failure into in 1972 in the stockholm uh, world um, uh, conference um, or climate conference that uh, some countries talked about development some countries talked about climate they wanted to save the climate they wanted to have development and economic growth and they couldn't understand each other, they couldn't find a com compromise, and it was a big, big failure. So in this concept that you want to save the world in the Western countries, you cannot find any compromise with others, and you cannot sit at the same table. So in my point of view, we have now similar goals like the SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the common project, what I uh, said before, to bring people to work together, to get to know each other and sit at the same table. We have the Paris Agreement, what we have achieved in 2015 to bring more than 190 countries on the table. And we have the implementation of nature-based solutions. So this means these common goals for, for the common global challenges 
we must have to connect, to reconnect to each other and to go to address these issues globally. So we need this puzzle, as I said before, to address these challenges because these are global challenges. Nobody can um, um, solve, them. solve them. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, maybe um, very, uh, it's a hard word to address them. And <laughs> what I learned from my grandmother was to serve the world, not to, so, to um, save the world. So when, when you go with this ideology that you want to serve the world um, and you see a banana uh, skin on the street and you see someone is coming, maybe he fell slip over and break his or her arms. If you want to serve, serve the world, you remove this banana skin from the street to prevent any uh, um, disastrous um, or catastrophes or you say you see that these people slip over and um, breaks his or her arms and this, you s save him uh, take him to the hospital which one makes sense <laughs> in this in this world then serve the world hmm. excellent excellent um you you ladies you you look like shy you don't raise your hands um, so in, in the meantime, I will make a comment. I would, I would like to invite, um, um, hopefully you are already doing that, dear attendants, but there is a rich uh, stream of very interesting comments in the chat box. So please look at that and read all of them, full of interesting comments. I would like to emphasize uh, one made by Petra Künkel, who, as I said at the start of the session is uh, coordinated together with Mampel and myself, the Emerging New Civilizations Initiative of the Club of Rome. And um, she makes a comment on uh, how the onset of the split, this, this split between ourselves and, and nature started in, in Europe pretty much, I guess it's not a coincidence, pretty much at the same time we have the onset of uh, science, as we as we call it, with a, a capital S, you know, with Descartes and Francis Bacon, and the Inquisition of witches, you know, of women who had held the wisdom of the way of the web of life, and um, this leads me to come back to the point of in another comment by another attendant um, it was men uh, mention was made about the possibility of growth with compassion through improvements in science well we see that science happened started the science we know today started at a moment uh, where we were also at the same time uh, splitting from wisdom and in particular from wisdom carried by by women so can we reconcile science also for that purpose, for the purpose of being compassionate? Uh, what do you think? Uh, Sam, maybe you have something to say. Or, uh, or Amanda, we haven't heard you for a while. So Sam? Yeah, so Samantha, I've, sorry. <laughs> I've made some notes um, on the previous question and also will touch upon a little on the comment that you've just made. Um, going back to the logic of life, I just wanted to add that life doesn't need us to formalize an understanding of it. All we need to know is that life begets life. In the sense, death is also life. Decay is an important part of regeneration. Life is regenerative. Even more important for an individual, life is local. Life is within our reach. Another comment that was made was there might be a better path, not a conflict between science and society. And my response to that is sure, there's, there's always a better path. Which universe are we in? Which is the path that we are on and where are we headed? I consider myself a pessimist, but maybe more accurately described as a realist. Are we truly observing and understanding the current human ecosystem. What is the path that we are currently on? How will we keep moving because of our inertia, our momentum? Where are we headed? Are we being real with ourselves? 
if we are being real with ourselves, we know Paris is not enough, not close. We are fighting to uphold something that climate scientists are saying today will not avoid a hothouse earth, will not support human civilization as we know it today. And so I'd also like to question our definition of civilization. So far, it sounds like all our conversations assumes that civilization will look quite similar to what we have right now in terms of what we are trying to save. My question is, what is enough? Okay, thank you. Amanda, may I provoke you to say something? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm thinking quite a lot because I do think this point that Samantha's making on momentum, and I think it was also in your question as well, Carlos, around what are the, what are the systems or factors that promotes current types of momentum? And what kinds could also help to breed an alternative culture um, that is aligned with the vision we share? And I, I do feel that as a whole, as a panel, um, we have been speaking a lot to what is traditionally more feminine kind of qualities, values, and characters, which um, makes sense in some ways, not only because of our identities perhaps, but also just because of the state of the world at the moment. And I actually got into economics in the beginning because I was so interested in feminist theory and I came across economics and I was like, what? This seems very gendered, <laughs> yeah? So the assumption that everybody's individualistic, rational, competitive individuals, I was like, okay, well that's one side of this dichotomy, but what about the compassion and interdependencies and cooperation? Um, because I don't think that this is a male, female thing. I think all of us have inside of us both of those things, but we've built institutions which very strategically encourage and reward one side of ourselves relative to the other, regardless of uh, you know, our bodies. And, and what we end up seeing as a result of that is, you know, there's those studies, for example, of something like 25% or 20% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are diagnosable sociopaths because they are rational, competitive, individualistic entities. They are this per person we theorize on and they don't have empathy and they don't recognize sort of the interconnections of things. Um, and we are all end up being very subconsciously influenced by those assumptions. So there was like another study I was reading recently where just normal people, normal people were given a, a task of, of writing a letter with some bad news. But prior to this, they had to unscramble a word jumble. Yeah, and just make, make the word. And one of the groups got some economic words in there and the other group did not. And the group that were just exposed to an economic word ended up providing far less empathy when they were writing those letters. And so I think this has seeped into our subconscious a lot. And I don't think it's inevitable. Um, I think our economy already has, like, it's a system where we provide for each other, right? So our lives, we've been provided for freely outside of a monetary system through caregivers and community members and things like this. And that is as much a part of the way of our economy is function as it is the competitive sort of exploitive side. It's just about shining more light on that, encouraging more of that kind of behavior and trying to rebalance it in our system to try to counterbalance the momentum, I guess, that uh, Sam is speaking to. Carlos, the, the uh, complaints that we are not taking, checking the chat box and the questions uh, sufficiently. I want to return to the issue of SDGs that uh, other day raised earlier on, because there is no doubt that the Sustainable Development Goals were a major triumph of consensus building. Um, but like most of those things that we arrive at through consensus, within them are imponderables that we rather not talk about. Because the people who, who do these uh, number crunchings tell us that there is no way 
that we as a human community today can achieve those sustainable development goals without imploding the whole biosphere because as as it is now we are consuming at the rate of 1,7 planets and, and the, I mean 1,7 the ability of our planet to regenerate so if we are going to meet those sustainable development goals as stated without a major rethinking of what is enough and how uh, we can do with much less and share more, we're not going to be able to meet those goals without creating more planetary emergencies. And I think this is a, a, uh, a conversation that we as a global community are afraid to have. Because on one hand, obviously it would be fantastic if everybody had food and everybody was at school, but to do that, we need to free up the resources trapped in this ostentatious consumption, overconsumption of the rest of the world that has yet, I mean, that is looking to support the achievement of the Millennium Develop, I mean, or the Sustainable Development Goals. And so I think this new civilization we're talking about, or this emerging new civilization for the global community, for the human society that we are talking about, it's really about, it's not the fancy parts. Of course, they are the beautiful fancy parts of dancing, but they're the real issues of how do we make sure that everybody has enough by those of us who are having more than enough right now, being willing to be part of a transformation system that would lead us to all enjoy like the people of Vermont having a little a community meeting. That's why I think those kind of transformations happen best at community level. Uh, but there are obviously some policy issues that have to also be taken to reward and or incentivize those kind of local level uh, transformations that need to happen. So I think we should not, uh, Carlos, in our exploration of this new emerging civilization, we need to tackle this issue. We, we skirt around it. You, Carlos, you're muted. Sorry, uh, I, I cannot agree more to what uh, Mampela just said. So uh, this is one of our blind spots. Uh, the blind spot that sustainable development, the way we define it today is an oxymoron. And it's uh, pretty clear if you look at, uh, we love to look at quantitative measures, you know, we love to feel anything we do with indicators, blah, blah, blah. This is part of the mechanistic thinking, but yet sometimes it is useful to reveal some blind spots. So for instance, if you look at a uh, human development index measuring combination of health, uh, life expectancy, and uh, um, um, education, educational level, and, uh, and prosperity as measured by GDP per capita, you look at that versus the ecological footprint, you see that sustainable well-being is an oxymoron. Wherever they are, there are high levels of HDI, of human development measure as that. There are very, very high levels of ecological footprint and vice versa. And some countries which are more or less in the balanced positions, we never look at them. Those countries are the Philippines, where Samantha is now, uh, Cuba, Jamaica, etc. So there is something, there is a weird blind spot in, in when we talk about sustainable development. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. 
Then I would like to have a last um, round of short, uh, very short interventions on a question put forward by, by one of our attendants. Uh, the, the, um, the chat box has become hotter and hotter, which measures the, ent <laughs> the growing enthusiasm of the attendants, which I can perfectly understand. One of them is asking, how do we integrate this approach as pillar in our societal learning systems? which is a little bit like, uh, well, okay, and what do, we, what do we do from now on? What are the next, what are the, our ideal next steps? Uh, so very short round of interventions by all of you. Let's start uh, with Samantha, for instance. Well, I will make a very short comment. I think what we need is a giant propaganda machine for regenerating okay. the planet. Thank you. Okay, well noted. Rebecca. Thank you, Carlos, and thanks, Samantha. I think we really need that. Uh, um, well, from my point of view, the system change must be collective, and collective does not mean that individuals uh, should take on their shoulders the responsibility of these choices, but governments should. Uh, and I think I imagine that coordinated action, global action from governments is needed from right now on uh, to, to make, put a strong push against uh, all those resource depletion that we see now. So planned obsolescence, uh, single use uh, uh, of, of, of products. And so shifting from product society to service society is something that we've been talking about so much also with you, Carlos. Um, we have to, make a system change, but this should be agreed upon. And uh, citizens should, should, should be involved in the decision-making processes, of course, uh, for their own territories, for their own communities, uh, about the, 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 the right solutions. But uh, yeah, main direction, the main, main goals should be set uh, all together, because if we don't do it all together, we will, we will not make it. So we have to, Put, uh, how do you say it, um, put a limit to the industrial growth, to the industrial uh, way of, uh, of using resources. So optimization from, from that. We, we don't pay for the resources we get from nature and this is not fair for the communities that substantially live on them. As I did. Um, yeah, thank you, Carlos. Yes, I think this is a very important point, what um, Rebecca already mentioned. We must act collectively. That's, that's completely true. Um, in our world with uh, global challenges, we cannot um, uh, preserve our biodiversity, our pandas in China and our koalas in Australia and our um, beautiful um, um, how do you call it, tigers in, in, the, in the continent Africa without a collective action. So it means when we want to address these um, global issues such as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, such as um, limiting what Rebecca already said, uh, limiting uh, economic growth, uh, such as um, preserving biodiversity and pr promoting of nature-based solutions, these are all required a collective action and all actors of the globe uh, needs to come to the table and they must find a compromise, not kicking out each other out the table. Um, it doesn't help us. Okay. And uh, may I, I, I to... yeah. no, may, may, may I precise a little bit because just for the last interventions and I will leave the last one for you, Mantella, okay. so you will have time uh, about because uh, one of the comments recently uh, on the chat in the chat box is about uh, uh, education and how important it is. And yes, of course. I mean, we had a, we started the day with a panel on on education and education for social transformation. But uh, without addressing the the issue of cultural transformation, how we change our fears, needs, and our idea of what is acceptable or not, we will not change education either. So uh, Samantha has a very concrete proposal, a giant propaganda machine that's certainly part of what we need. So may I, so Audrey and Amanda, may I um, uh, 
provoke you for your uh, last interventions on this. Yes, but how do we change culture? Because we don't know how to do that, right? Or do we? Yeah, Audrey? Uh, I, I want to go back to what Mampella started in the beginning on the topic of spirit. And, and the reason I want to do that is I want to take a pragmatic lens to that. We tend to value things in dollars and currency, but there are some things like people's lives that cannot be valued. And I think we've created this paradigm where we put a dollar on the environment, we put a dollar on people's lives in terms of how much medical facilities they need. But even, you know, all this has been exposed in the COVID um, system. And so I think we're going back, we're tying again back to that subjectivity, objectivity dance, as I can say, because we're yearning to put numbers on things and quantify our progress in climate change. Um, and it's time, I think, that we really think about how we value things value it without necessarily putting a number or a quantitative um, association with that. Um, and that a value of a life cannot have a dollar figure on that. So how do we create a new paradigm? And so that's, that would be my suggestion, Carlos. You're on mute, Carlos. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Amanda, uh... We lost Amanda? Ah, oh, no, she's here. Okay, uh, Amanda, what's your take? Um, yes, so I think I, I definitely agree with what Audrey is saying. So I'm, I'm speaking, you know, coming from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, um, our entire perspective is that one of the major problems of our current world is that we have this one-size-fits-all economic model that is imposed in communities and cultures around the world regardless of whether or not it is aligned with those values or context or or priorities um, and that in order to transform our economic system into one that promotes human and ecological well-being we need to create space yeah. So we need to create that space, I think, through both bottom up and top down action. So the bottom up is around us as communities and as individuals being more generous, organizing participatory processes to really have an idea of, of what we value, what this vision is for our communities, the types of principles and rules that we want to have collectively to sort of govern that system. But at the top down, we also need to be honest about extreme power imbalances in the world. Multinational corporations control the world now. Nation states, a couple, maybe have some influence, but ultimately they are the power players. So if we want to even carve out the space for the local self-determination and to build different kinds of economic blueprints in different places that can, that can guide us or provide inspiration, um, we need to regulate. We need to come together as a world to regulate and create some common minimum standards for multinational corporations in order, as Mampella said, to be able to get the money that's in offshore bank accounts and that is currently being held in order to, to ensure that it, there is enough for everyone. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, Mampella, you have some minutes for the closing comments. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am by the energy that has been flowing around uh, this panel and, of course, from the, the participants and the, the, the audience. What I sense is a real yearning for a different way of being and organizing ourselves as a human community. And so I would suggest that the first thing we need to recognize or acknowledge that the learning pillars that somebody was saying, how do we integrate this into the learning, current learning pillars? The first thing is to recognize why we have avoided bringing a, a cultural lens to the education process. Why have, you know, there, there are assumptions about education being value-free, being scientific, being, whereas in fact, if education is about the development of the best in us, and each one of us, as people were saying, is a unique creature, 
that it cannot be with you know it can be culture free can be value free can be it can be called it's got to have a recognition of the spirit in each one of the people participating in the teaching and the learning and so i think the first practical thing about how we move in this process of exploring the pathway to a new emerging civilization is recognition of the importance of acknowledging what's there and as Carl says, remove, identifying the, the blind spots and removing the big boulders and the other things that are covering our eyes. The second thing is about acknowledging that for us to make this transition, this transformation, it's going to, we're going to have to bring our spirits into this. So self-liberation from our own internal struggles is very important, both for the learners and for the teachers. Because if we don't wrestle with the, the consciousness that's needed to be brought into this engagement, we're then going to have a meaningless exercise. Uh, and I, I'm uncomfortable with the, I know uh, Samantha is using propaganda in a, in a provocative sense, but propaganda has unfortunately had intonations of impositions. But I think what we're really talking about is unlearning the things that uh, we have learned, which are now real burdens on our shoulders and have cluttered our imaginations and preventing us from imagining the what we regard as unimaginable. The third point is to say that we need to acknowledge that each one of us needs to change the way we are in order to be part of something new. And it's not about men have to change and be more feminine or women have to uh, be more assertive. It is about each one of us as men and women have the feminine and the masculine in us, but we choose which one to, to lead with. But there is a, going back to the dance, the, the, max, the masculine in me as a, a very feminine woman dances with the, with the feminine. And we've got to let that be because that makes us whole. It is this fighting that makes us psychopaths or whatever, that we, when we fight what ought to be a, 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 a complex dance, which obviously is not like a scientific problem solution where you're going to un end up with the right answer. There's no right answer. And, and my final point, Carlos, is that we need to engage in intergenerational conversations about these matters. It can't just be something that we talk about on these panels. It's got to be in our classrooms, in our preschools, in our um, spiritual or other religious conversations in the workplaces in the way we play because when we do that we will have insights uh, that are difficult to get when i'm sitting here in my study but if i'm engaging with people in the process of playing or walking or whatever incredible magic happens and and so my I leave this panel greatly encouraged that there is an energy and a hunger out there for this emerging new civilization. But what we need to do is simply to come together as these little villages, these uh, points of light, and create the magic that is possible to create because we know it can happen at the village level it can also happen at the global village level thank you carlos
Thank you to all of you. Thank you to you, Mampella, I mean, uh, for your wise words. Uh, I mean, I, th I think it's important. Hopefully, I, I don't know if somebody has discovered something which is evident that wisdom comes from the mother, from the mother continent. And you, you make it so evident, you know, something we should, uh, I mean, even if we know that we should practice that um, more often, um, Samantha says to me that I skipped you as a day in the last round uh, of, uh, is that true? Did I commit that uh, mistake? Skip me? What do you mean by skipping me? <laughs> that, that you didn't have the occasion to, to give your last word. You did. I right? did. I did. Okay. Okay. Oof. No worries. I'm, re I'm relieved. So, um, <laughs> Uh, talking about the mother continent, uh, it was planned to have a second voice from Africa in this panel, from Ndidi Noli Edosian. Unfortunately, she had to attend an emergency, a health emergency in her family. And uh, so this is why she, want, she wasn't with us today. And, but I would like to thank, of course, all the panelists, but also all the attendants who have been extremely active in the chat box sharing a lot of ideas a lot of references and uh, thank you in particular to petra kinkel uh, who is also who has been also attending uh, there is a lot also of wisdom in what has been said in the in the chat box and a lot of good compliments to the panelists by the way so which i can perfectly understand i'm happy to have organized this session with all of you have a very good day wherever you, you are and let's pursue this venture together bye thank you bye to all of you bye. thank you thank you everyone goodbye bye. Thank, thank you, you. Bye. bye have bye. a good evening morning thank you good morning <laughs> i hope we get a chance to talk more all of us yeah yes well we can, well, we can do yeah, we can, yeah. Hello. Yes. May I suggest that we find a way of doing a debriefing? Yes, mm -hmm. of course. And, and if lovely. The, the secretariat to help us with uh, collating the chats and the questions, because that mm -hmm. will be very helpful for the elaboration of some kind of, I, 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 I don't want to call it a document, but a kind of spider web that we might have hanging over us so we can get all the threads and pull them together. Okay. All yeah, right. yeah and the attendants are saying yes, please. So we will do Thank that. You. <laughs> Let's do that. Bye bye. Okay. bye. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Post me there. Yes, please. Thank you.